God's amazing grace. Isn't that awesome? Wow, that song always gets me. No matter how many times we sing it. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you for everything that you are and um, all that you're doing in your people. Lord, uh, we thank you for 2 Corinthians. And um, God, today as we continue our series, God bless your word, we pray. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about camping uh, off the start here today. You know, I've, I've always loved camping. And uh, the adventure of a good camping trip uh, somewhere off the beaten track over the years has been uh, appealing to me and a very refreshing change from my daily routine. And, uh, well, nowadays it seems that people think of camping as... Uh, taking their home away from home uh, with them. And maybe, maybe some of you guys have RVs. Well, from personal experience, <laughs> an RV or a motorhome is, is definitely more comfortable than a tent. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah, everyone, everyone agrees with that. Um, now, the older I get, it seems, uh, the more that I appreciate uh, a motorhome or a cabin when I'm on a uh, camping trip. And uh, it's it's more comfortable. It's more permanent than a tent. And, uh, you know, so I, remember, I remember different camping trips that I've had, some really good, and uh, some were absolutely horrid. And um, I remember one point in my journey uh, on a mountain hunting trip, uh, sleeping in a tube tent in the rain, tied off on a precipice because that was the only place that I had to sleep. And uh, I'll tell you, I didn't get much sleep during that time. The wind was howling, the rain was pouring, and uh, it was a little bit scary. Um, now, I've, I've slept in a homemade tent uh, made of tree branches, and in the middle of the night had a mountain lion come up in behind where I was sleeping in the, the, uh, the lean-to tent that I had. And uh, sleeping in a, and, uh, an open lean-to, it's a little bit unnerving. Um, I see some of the other things. I, I remember a spring uh, camping trip when Ginny and I got married. I think I've told this in an illustration before, where we were camped beside a beautiful lake, and uh, the weather turned sour, and it started pouring. And uh, I thought, nothing's going to stop me from going and catching those trout in that lake. So my wife's nice and comfy in the tent, I think. Uh, that's what I thought. No. <laughs> As soon as I went down away from uh, where we were camped, the tent blew down on top of her. And uh, she was soaking wet and tired and, uh, and ornery when I got back. It, she, she actually wasn't there. She went in the car and went for a drive. So not the exact uh, wonderful uh, time out there. Um, I, I remember another trip, however, where, you know, I was up in an alpine meadow and... Uh, uh, flowers, the wild flowers were all around. around. It was I sunny, remember and another calm, trip, however, where and these little uh, alpine, alpine marmots. Uh, they'd uh, never uh, seen a tent before, I think, because uh, they were all sunny, on the little calm. hills right around where I was camped, looking at me and chirping. <laughs> they were uh, chirp, they chirp, chirp, chirp. It was beautiful. Uh, what a wonderful camping experience. It was just wonderful. Now, um, chirp, chirp, it was beautiful. What a wonderful camping. The thing about tents is that. They're not permanent dwelling no, places. Um, in the ancient Near East, uh, the thing about tents, there were no motorized vehicles, and if you were on a journey to a faraway place, place, you would pack your cart, your possessions, East, uh, your family, no your horse, your donkey, and, and your camel, or whatever you had there, place, and you'd cart, bring a tent. A tent family, is not horse, a permanent donkey, dwelling. Camel, it's a portable dwelling there, made for adventuring or traveling uh, is not to another place. place. Today my message to you is from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and our text this morning is verses 1 to 10 and it is entitled Longing for Home. So if you have your Bibles this morning would you please turn with me uh, to this passage starting with verse 1. Of all the apostle says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, 
we have a building from God, for we know an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. We have a building Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. And while, for while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who finished or fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing for what is to come. Now if I could just say one thing about what we just read in those first five verses of our text this morning. I would say that this is the key point. Paul admonishes us to look at what we cannot see. Now here in this chapter, the Apostle Paul illustrates the present life of human beings to that of living in a tent. And the point of what Paul is saying is that our present bodies being like a tent are not our permanent places of residence. Tents are taken down, they wear out, and they're subject to decay. Death is spoken of as the dissolving of our mortal tents that we presently dwell in. Our bodies are suited to this creation that we live in in this present time only for a short time, but outwardly we waste away as we saw in the last few verses of our text from last week. Outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. All a person has to do to realize that the tent is starting to wear out and is starting to um, to change is to look into the mirror to realize it. Now in our present circumstances, all of us, every single one of us are subject to illness, to trials, to calamities of different kinds. But the scripture teaches us that we as believers are a breath away from a major, awesome transition. All of us, you see, we're going to face death. The prospect of mortal death is on us every day. We suffer, and then we die, and we transition. 100% of us, not, not one single one of us unless the rapture comes, um, in our lifetime, 100% of us face the corruption of the grave as our final resting place in this body on the earth. There's no escaping it. From the time we're born to the time we die, the clock is ticking. We maybe have a year, maybe we have 10, 20, 40, 65, 80, or 105 years to live, and then our mortal body goes into a state of decay and goes into the grave. But this being said, Paul assures us that here, when this tent is disassembled, and when it goes to the grave, the spirit of the believer goes to be with the Lord. And even if the present sufferings that we encounter in this journey of ours, even if they're intense enough to actually lead to physical death, Paul says that we can be confident of a glorious future to come. Now for those of us who belong to the Lord, He's gone ahead of us. He's prepared a glorious, permanent house for us to dwell in. Not just a city or a kingdom to dwell in, but also a permanent residence for our soul and our spirit to inhabit. God promises that our permanent home is actually a beautiful, beautiful safe, and strong building. God promises our, that our future home is not made by the hands of man or not of this present creation. The old tent from this present realm will soon be gone, but a wonderful, glorious house awaits the believer. So what happens to a believer immediately after he or she dies? Let's talk about that for a few minutes. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, um, it's clear that the believer does not get or her, uh, his or her glorified body, this permanent dwelling, 
Um, it's immediately upon our death. This happens after Jesus comes back for his church. So let's read First Corinthians or First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. And he says this, he says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, we will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Aren't those encouraging words? The Lord has an encouraging word for us today, I believe. The scriptures teach us that until the day of the second coming of Christ, there is a realm that we're ushered to. We're not given our unperishable bodies right away, but there is a realm that we're ushered to. Remember, when Jesus was crucified, there were two thieves being crucified along beside of him. One thief, he was not penitent. He was a mocker, and he was wicked in his heart, and he mocked the Lord. And the other thief was penitent. He, he repented inside. He saw that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And uh, if you remember that scripture in Luke 23, 43, was the Son he recognized Jesus for who he was. And uh, he said this, he said, he said, when you enter your kingdom, Lord, when you enter your kingdom, Lord, remember me. And what did Jesus say in return? And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This gives us a hint of what happens when we immediately die and we are a believer in Christ. The corruptible physical body of the believer will sleep in death, but his soul and his spirit will be present with the Lord immediately upon a person's transition until Christ returns. Once Jesus returns, then what is mortal will be swallowed up in immortality. The believer will be given a new, incorruptible body, a permanent dwelling. At the end of the present earth and every everything in it will be destroyed by fire. The scriptures speak of this. A new heaven and a new earth will be will be created, and his redeemed children will dwell with him in that realm, enjoying his presence and his pleasure forever. First Corinthians chapter two, verse nine says this. But as, as it is written, eye has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things for which God has prepared for those that love him. We can't even conceive it, my friends. The glory that awaits the Christian that goes to be with his Savior, God has gone and prepared a place for us. And when he comes again, he's going to receive us unto himself. And he's going to give us glorified bodies. Not subject to corruption. Not subject to the elements. Not subject to the wild animals and the dangers and the storms of life that are around us. A, a dwelling place that will be firm and secure and founded upon the rock. And God will make sure that all of our sorrows are washed away. That is a beautiful hope. What a wonderful hope. But for those in this world who do not believe not everybody in this world is going to experience what is promised to the believer. Some people say, well, I'll find my own way and I'll make my own way to heaven and I think I'm a good enough person that I'm just going to be able to make it there and they're going to let me in. So they trust in themselves or they trust in a foreign God. Not all paths lead to eternal life. My friends, we have to look at the scriptures as to what the scriptures say. What is truth? The Bible is truth. The word of God is truth. And what the word of God says in Acts chapter 4, 12 is that salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by by which we must be saved. People who refuse to come to Jesus for salvation and try to find salvation through themselves, 
were on their own through false gods, who are not really gods at all, will find themselves in a state of eternal loss. Salvation is salvation because human beings outside of the Lord Jesus Christ are sinners and need to be saved. There's not one righteous, not even one. All of us have the penalty of death over us. And if we don't come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we cross over to the other side, there is a terrible judgment awaiting. People who think of themselves good enough to be accepted into eternal life in the kingdom of God on their own merits or through false gods are deceived. They overestimate their own righteousness and they underestimate God's holiness. Or through false in 2 Thessalonians 2, 10b to 12, Paul writes concerning these people. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will refuse or so that they will believe the lie and so that they will be condemned who have not believed in the truth but have delighted in wickedness. It is a sad reality that many of the people that we see around us as a matter of fact, most, when they die, they will find that there is no sacrifice to take away for their, their sins because they have not believed in God's one and only Son, the salvation of the world. When the soul and the spirit of the believer is ushered into paradise, the unbelievers will be ushered into hell or Hades, and there will be no escape. Here they will remain in chains, in torment, in gloomy dungeons, along with the enemies of God, the angels, that were locked away once judged along with Satan and the fallen angels at God's great white throne judgment at the end of the present age all whose names were not written in Jesus book of life the Lamb's book of life will be cast into the lake of fire along with hell itself the devil and all of his angels and this will be the second lake of fire Along with my friends this should sober us this should sober us with the mission that God has given us to take his gospel the good news of salvation through Jesus into the world we ought to be very concerned with those that are lost and perishing it ought to grieve us it ought to cause us to ask the Lord to be to make us ambassadors for him to bring the message of hope and reconciliation to these people that don't know their right hand from their left they're lost in darkness groping in the darkness they can't see because their minds have been blinded but God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life and you my friends are the church. You're the church of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. The Holy Spirit dwells within you and He calls you. He calls you to be ambassadors for Him, to shed the light of the gospel into every corner that you live. Take His gospel into the world. Preach His gospel to the lost, to the perishing, because there's no salvation in this world system. There's no salvation in the things of the temporary realm. There's only salvation in Jesus Christ, and you are his ambassadors. You are reconciled to Christ. You have been given the light of the Holy Spirit. You have been given a commission, and God commands us to go. He says, go into all the world. For how can they hear without a messenger? You are the messengers of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just an evangelist on television. It's not just the pastor on Sunday morning throwing a lure over the pulpit, hoping a fish will bite. God calls each one of us into his kingdom business. You are reconciled to God. You are a light on a hill, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Kingdom business. The place of torment is not a pleasant place and God doesn't want people to go there. The scriptures teach us in 2 Peter chapter 3, 8 to 10, but do not forget this thing, my dear friends, with the Lord a thousand, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. Instead he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God is patient with the world. His patience means sell opportunities for salvation. And he calls us to go and be his ambassadors and to speak his word boldly and to share the love of Jesus with our neighbors, with the with the people that God has saw fit to put in our in our sphere of influence. 
Jesus with our neighbors. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear. The Lord's patience is to populate heaven. Will be laid bare. Everybody has an opportunity to choose what they're going to do. To accept the lie and so be deluded and deceived or to come to Jesus and be saved. What they're going to do. For those of us who have confidence because the Holy Spirit has sealed our future transformation as believers, as Paul says here, we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Paul says here, we do not wish to be unclothed. Some people have asked me over the years, how do you know that your way is the right way? How do you know that you're believing the right way? Well, there's a number of really good reasons why I could speak about those, uh, the reasons why I believe our way that we're speaking here is the right way. Now, I could speak about these reasons for hours. I really could. There's so many reasons to believe in Jesus. But I'm not merely a Christian because I hold to a philosophical ideology. I'm not merely a Christian because I can make sense of the world through biblical teachings. I'm not merely a Christian because everybody has to believe in something. I'm a Christian because the Holy Spirit of the living God has filled me and I'm spiritually alive in Him. And He walks with me and He talks with me and He tells me that I am His own. God's Spirit is alive. And He lives in me and He lives in you if you're a true believer in Christ. The Spirit of the living God lives in you. He is the truth that sets people free from their sins. He is the abundant life that every man, woman, and child was made to experience. Jesus is life. Abundant, overflowing life. Without Him, I'm just a shell of who I was intended to be. The people that are out there living for themselves are only a shell of what they were intended to be. When the Samaritan woman came to Jesus in the New Testament story in John 4, 14, Jesus told her, he said, whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now what I'm talking to you here today is experiential. The treasuries of heaven, although there is great philosophical perspectives in studying the Word of God, the treasuries of heaven Although it's not just philosophical ideas that we study. It's not just engaging our mind. And it's not just it's about, not just philosophical um, ideas about us. The water of the living God is the Holy mind. Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is a it's living person who makes His dwelling inside of us. Um, and what does us. the Spirit do? He doesn't draw attention to us. The he draws attention to Jesus the Christ. Spirit the, Spirit the Spirit testifies that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He speaks that. He draws attention to the Spirit was never meant the Spirit to be something just to be consumed that Jesus Christ by us the truth for our own pleasure and that. feelings. Although, the Spirit it feels pretty good to be at one with God, doesn't it? It feels good to be cleansed. It feels good to be clean. That's true, but that's the side effect of having the Spirit of God living in you. In 2 Corinthians here, um, we see... That's the side effect. Now one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit. It is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Earlier in his letters to the Corinthians, Paul said to 1 Corinthians, the, the first book of Corinthians, chapter 6, he said this, in 19 and 20, he said, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God with your body. You're a temple that the Holy Spirit has made His presence known in. He resides in us. And He's fashioned us for this very purpose. You see, the Holy Spirit that is deposited in the believer and the experience that we have with Him, the love that flows from God through the Spirit inside of the believer is a seal, a deposit, guaranteeing the beautiful things that are to come. This is God's treasury for the down payment. The beautiful thing but there is coming a day when this light will be passed away and everything will be made new and the glory of it all is going to be in full bloom. We're going to see Jesus face to face. 
all of the troubles of this world will be forgotten. It's going to be in full bloom. What a wonderful day that's going to be. Our risen bodies, they're going to fade away. We can see it happening. We look in the mirror. We feel it in our bones. What a wonderful day that's going to be. But there will be a day. Our present bodies, they're going to fade away. There's a song that's out there by Jeremy Camp. says, there will be a day with no more tears, no more doubts, and no more fears. There will be a day when the burdens of this place will be no more. We will see Jesus face to face. No more tears, no more doubts, and no more fears. So this is where Paul. When the burdens of this place will be no more. We will see Jesus Paul encourages and exhorts us to be confident this is where Paul about our future. Paul <laughs> we can have confidence to know that this is the truth. About the future. Spirit testifies to it. The Word of God speaks we can of it. Have Therefore, Paul says in verses 6 to 8, we are always truth. confident to know that as long as we are at home in this body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We're confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and to be at home with the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We long for it. As believers, we long for that day. Faith is defined as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Our faith, brothers and sisters, is not blind, nor is it ignorant. There are many reasons to believe what we believe, but when it comes down to it, we're called to place our trust in Jesus, even when we can't clearly see the road ahead, even when we see only our future, as though we're looking at what taking, what's taking place, around us trying to see ahead like we're looking through a, a piece of darkened glass we can't really see clearly what's ahead the truth is we can see movement we can see God putting things together but we can't see it clearly we desire to see it clearly but we can't in the early church it seems as though there was a tremendous focus on living with the hope for the life to come a tremendous focus on that Understanding that the present life we live in is like a tent that is wearing out. This was the blessed hope of the saints. And they endured tremendous persecution from the Romans and the other people, the Jews around them, for, for the stand they took. But they, looked, they were looking ahead. They knew that this was a tent that they dwelled in and that it wasn't permanent. The early saints were taught by the apostles to trust God in the midst of their storms. The apostles encouraged them. Their future is bright, even though the present day is dark and difficult. All too often today, particularly in the Western Church, where we've experienced so much creature comforts in the here and now, up to this point, folks, I, think, I fear that many of us have lost our focus. In and instead of looking at what is to come point, and having our hopes hope set on the brilliant I future I that we have, have we become hope. entangled, we become consumed in the life in the here and now as those, as though this tent that we're in is our permanent dwelling. We long to be clothed with our eternal dwelling and we want a taste of it here and now. So I fear that sometimes we dig in. We long for that permanency. It's in us. We see it, but we're longing maybe for a theocracy where Jesus is king over the land that we live in here and now. But we have to remember we're like campers. Maybe we've had a good week of weather in the tent where the flowers are blooming and the birds are singing and the fish are splashing. Maybe we've had a good week of And we wish we could dig in and we wish we could camp out on the shore and stay there for the whole summer. Only to come upon a bad week of weather where the wind starts to blow, the rain pours, and our tent leaks, and the dangerous wild animals are stalking around us. We want to go back to the good week that we had. We want the tent to be in the good week through our, our existence in this life. We want to go back to the good dwelling in it, and we get upset and frustrated and angry, fighting for it. In our flesh, we recognize the brokenness and the discomfort of our present circumstances, and we long for the comforts and security of a permanent dwelling. But there is no permanency to the tent. The tent was never made to be permanent. We have to ask ourselves this question. Is my mind set on the things above, or is it set on the things of this world? This question. I know in my life, in my, my experience, my there's been times where I've been sidetracked and I've looked at the things of this world and I've dug in too deep. And I've allowed discouragements and, and my flesh to rise up because I, I, I'm trying to change things that I can't change. I'm trying to do things that I can't do. My 
This body is old. I'll rise up because I, I, I'm trying to change things that I can. I think change. I mentioned last week I'm how to do things that I, I tried to jump onto shore out of, my, out of my boat when I was on my little expedition out there. I think I mentioned And last I was week thinking, oh, yeah, I can do that. Uh-uh. I, uh -uh. I, I pulled my hamstring. I tore part of my hamstring doing that because I'm not 22 oh, yeah, years old. I used to be able to hop over a picnic table with one hop. I asked my wife about that. I used to go running and jumping over picnic tables for fun. Can't do that anymore. If I did that, I'd bash my shins and I'd probably break my neck. <laughs> I'd jump out of the lake onto the shore and I'd pull my hamstring. This body is wasting away. The life that we have in our flesh is wasting away, folks. Onto the shore and I pull my hamstring. This body is wasting away. The life that we have in uh, our flesh is wasting away. Folks. In our flesh, we recognize the brokenness and the discomfort when we come into experiences like that, don't we? Uh, we can let our longing for this permanent dwelling and our upsetness that we're not actually in our permanent dwelling distract us from the mission of the people out there that are perishing. God doesn't want us to get our mind off the mission. This is why I am troubled sometimes when I see a steady diet of eschatology. There are many modern day preachers who claim to be prophets and claim to see into the future with absolute clarity, but much of their speech is based on human wisdom and human guessing. Many teachers are capitalizing on people's curiosity about the, un, about the tense that's permanent. They're trying to talk about a permanence. People long to preserve their life in the here and now, and it's natural. We want to preserve life. God's made us as eternal beings, and we recognize this. People long to preserve their life in the here and now, and it's natural. We want to preserve. They capitalize on people's desire to to return to the good week of weather in the tent. They capitalize on people's. They long to control the outcomes in the here and now, and see the kingdom of God established in the nation and across the globe. In the here and now. Some believers fall prey to this. And they become steady consumers of eschatology. It's like a candy. But the problem with this is eschatology and its purpose was not meant to get us focusing on living in the here and now and the comfort of the happy, happy, beautiful vistas that we've experienced throughout our lives. That's not what it's for. It was meant to encourage us that God is sovereign and He's pointing to the fact that our lives here are wearing out. They're merely a tent that is wearing out. God has much better things in store for the believers. The time is getting short in getting the gospel message to those who don't believe. The time is short. Paul once spoke to the Philippian believers about this present need he had in his circumstances that were broken. He admitted his brokenness. Do you admit your brokenness today? I do. I'm broken. I can't wait for my permanent dwelling. I don't know about you, but I long for it. God help us. Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Paul admits his weakness, but he says this. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in each and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. And when it comes to understanding the end times, God has not purposeful clarity to us as to times and dates and events that when things are going to occur. People want to understand with clarity. They do. Because they want, they want this present brokenness to end. To understand with clarity. Because they want, they want this present brokenness to end. And they want to be able to live on sunny shores at the campsite where the loons are calling out and the fish are splashing and the water is calm and the sun is shining. At the campsite. They want it. Where the loons are calling out and the fish are splashing and the world is calm and the sun is shining. the trials of life come. God's wanting us to learn to be content to realize that yes there's going to be times when we're going to have those sunny days on the lake shore there's also going to be those times where the tempest blows and our weakness shows our frailty shows I want to emphasize I'm not saying anything 
is wrong with eschatology and looking at the end times. I'm not saying that at all. Don't don't misunderstand me, please. I want to emphasize I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying that eschatology is meant to encourage us that God is sovereign and he's not out of control in this present storm that we're facing. Eschatology is not given as a formula to help us usher in some sort of social change in the here and now. That's what we call kingdom now theology. Eschatology is not given as a formula. It's been prevalent in the North American church. It's worked its way through the North American church, but it's not healthy. It's not healthy. Kingdom now theology is not healthy because it distracts us from our mission in the here and now. Our mission is out there. God wants us to obey Him. Jesus commands us to go. Jesus commands us to mobilize and to use our gifts for furthering the, the message of the gospel. Jesus commands us to mobilize and to use our gifts. Friends, Jesus is coming soon, amen. He's coming. He's coming soon. Friends, Jesus is coming soon. And it could be tomorrow. We don't know the day or the hour that the Son of Man will come. He's coming soon. Everything has its time and its season, and God will bring to fruition that which He has promised. He's not slow at keeping His promises, as some understand slowness. God has called us and wants us to live by faith and not by sight, trusting in His promises and the glorious future He has in store. Although our flesh longs for that permanency, we can't control the outcome. The truth is that we're not in control. We're subject to aging, we're subject to, to injury, we're subject to frustration, we're subject to persecution, we're subject to the systems of this world that rise up against us. God's delay in return is salvation for the lost. That's his purpose. Salvation for those that don't know Jesus. Oh, church, God's calling us to jump in and work for Him in His fields with everything that we have. Not to get distracted from our mission, spending all of our time speculating and pondering whether or not we're experiencing the fulfillment of all prophecies and how that might affect us and our families in the here and now. That consumes, I've seen it, it consumes people to the point where that's all they diet on. They're not looking at the big picture because they're so enamored with that. To the point where that's all they die Prophecies on. were not meant to saddle us in chairs, digging us in and trying to preserve the camping spot here and now. Prophecies were not meant to saddle us. Prophetic word God was given to encourage us to get out of the chair and to work for the Lord's sake. Here and now. The harvest is plentiful. The fields are white unto harvest. There's so many non-Christians out there that don't know the truth, and the Lord has called the you. And yes, you have a testimony. That don't you have a testimony the truth that they need to that hear. The Lord has called you. And so yes, don't be shy in sharing it. Have a yeah, some of them are going to hate you. You might share it at, you, at, at the lunch table at work and you might get mocked. Be shy but then again, after work, the guy that's you. listening you in the corner silently at, at might go home and remember the Sunday school lesson he had when he was a kid and pick the Bible off the, the dusty Bible off the shelf and look into the scriptures and be saved because you have been obedient and faithful to the Lord's call. Uh, Paul spoke to Titus about having a healthy focus when he said this. He said, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things, so that they, those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and are useless. So in conclusion, Paul encourages us to please the Lord in everything we do since our future home is the ultimate reality and we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the things that we have done. 
in verse 9 of our text, we're exhorted to get working for the kingdom of for God's glory. Paul says, so we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. There is coming a day where we're going to be transitioned into our permanent dwellings. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see, when I shall look upon His face, the one who saved me by His grace, when, I, when He takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land. What a day, glorious day, that will be. Would you bow with me in prayer? Jesus, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your truth. We pray, God, that You give us singularity uh, of your mind, God, to, to see the world Jesus, as you see it, God, to reach those that are, are out there that need to hear the gospel. Lord, help us not to be distracted by the things around us, by the storms that blow upon these tents. God, you know we are weak, so we pray for grace. God, we long to be clothed in immor immortality. We long to be clothed in our new permanent dwelling, God. But Lord, until that day comes, we pray that you give us grace. We pray that you give us strength. We pray that you fill our hearts with peace so that we might shine for you like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life. God, I pray for those that are listening to this broadcast today. If they don't know you, Lord, I pray that they will come to know you. You can believe in Jesus today. You can ask him to be your savior. You don't have to wait. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he died for your sins. Confess with your mouth. And he's your Savior. You will be saved. And God will give you his Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that you just encourage the saints today. In Jesus' name. Amen.